Just being honest. Nothing but the truth, yeah. Welcome to another episode of CJ Honesty. Honesty. And today we have Joshua Shea. Yes. And, and today we're going to be talking about betrayal trauma. Yes, which is very important because a lot of people has been feel betrayed in their lives. So yes. we want to cover this yes. topic. A lot of people, mm -hmm. especially with the pandemic going on they feel lonely mm -hmm. um they've had people leave them for certain reasons a lot of divorces has happened a lot of things that have been found out you know spouse cheating on your girlfriend boyfriend mm -hmm. um people who have been in abusive relationships um children who have been in abusive uh relationships with their whoever their guardian is mm -hmm. so we just want to um get some healing for whoever is listening on today so today, let's start off with our scripture um, with one of the well-known, if if not the most known betrayals in the Bible. It's Luke 22, 48. So Luke chapter 22, verse 48 says, But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And... As you know, for those who, who, who read, that's the biggest betrayal that, uh, one of the biggest betrayals, if not the biggest betrayal in the Bible um, that you have with Judas betraying Jesus, uh, walking by Jesus' side for as long as he did, and he sold Jesus just for a couple of coins and silver. Mm -hmm. He gave over Jesus' life just for that, and he betrayed him. Uh, he let he let Pete. The person, the people that was coming to get him, he let them know that that's who Jesus was by giving Jesus a kiss. And I could think of no other way to be worse betrayed than by somebody kissing you there for well, your death to happen. So mm -hmm. uh, you want to tell everybody about our guest that we have today? Yes. Yeah, so we have Joshua Shea, who is a pornography addiction expert. Yes. A certified betrayal trauma coach and the author of three books on pornography, pornography addiction. He has appeared on nearly 250 podcasts, television and radio shows using his wealth of research and personal story to help others in promoting, promoting the ideas that porn addiction, um, you know, spans doesn't matter what color sex you are. And it, it's a um, major issue. And um, he has helped people with seeking help with their problem. And he's also contributed to articles about recovery to the fix.com um, website and recovery today magazine. He is a TEDx talk speaker and has developed and presented a porn addiction education lecture for churches, libraries, and other groups. He's been free from porn and sober since 2014 and Joshua still lives in central Maine with his wife and two children. Thank you for joining us today. And I want to thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Yes. We're, this is, yeah, I found this interesting. I never heard this term betrayal trauma. I've heard me betrayal either. before, but not this particular um, term. So I'm interested in learning about this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it's one of those terms that has only really been around about three, four years now. And essentially, it is the emotional reaction to learning that something that you considered a basic truth, something that you could count on 100% is not the way it is. And that trauma, that betrayal trauma is the is the emotional and physical reaction to it. Now, the silly way I explain it to people is we know that the sky is blue. We all know that the sky is blue. 
Well, if I told you you woke up one morning and I said, well, the sky is actually red. And you're like, no, no, no. And no, the sky is actually red. And you then walked outside and saw a red sky. And we, I said to you, well, we've had special uh, contact lenses in you since you were a baby. So you would think the sky was blue. It's actually red. Wow. That would rock your world. I know it seems silly, but the idea that you count 100% on the fact that the sky is blue. Now it's red. How does that change your world? What does that what does that mean? Well, you know, it's it's just the sky color. But what happens if, you know, it's your parents who tell you this? What happens if it's your partner who tells you this or your favorite teacher? You are going to feel that they lied to you. You are going to start to wonder what else have they lied about? Mm-hmm. Can I trust this person moving forward? And in real life examples, the biggest example is always uh, partners cheating on each other. Mm-hmm. When you think, you know, people who have been married five years, 10 years, 20 years, who think there is no chance whatsoever that their partner could cheat on them. They go through life knowing that they are one of those solid marriages or solid relationships that can't be shook. And then they found out, oh my goodness, this person has been going behind my back for two or three years. Or this person, um, I see it a lot in the uh, pornography addiction realm where I just found out that you know my husband or my wife's been looking at porn for six years Mm -hmm. and they know how much I, I can't stand it. And that rocks their world. Also important to note that it's not just in the realm of of married partners. Um, It can be, you know, your parents tell you when you're five years old, when you turn 15, you're all going to be moving to California. You're all going to be moving to Florida. So for 10 years, you get excited. You're looking forward to this. You want to do this. You can't wait. And the day before you're ready to move, they tell you that they've changed their mind and you're not moving. Mm-hmm. That can feel like a giant betrayal that they didn't, yeah. you know, they didn't keep that promise to you. Uh, it's a matter of feeling safe, feeling like promises are fulfilled, feeling like you can trust your reality because that's what gets shook um, with betrayal trauma is your reality just comes crumbling to the ground. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that wow. was a mouthful. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Never so the example about um the child that you just gave where the the parent changed their mind. I never looked at I never really looked at that as a betrayal, but I guess that is in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and there there are things like, you know, I, I have uh talked with uh therapists and other coaches who have who deal with children specifically with this. There are children who when their parents get divorced they feel a sense of betrayal. There are children when the first time somebody very close to them dies, they can feel a big sense of betrayal. And if they don't work through that when they're young, Mm -hmm. when they get older, much like I somewhat did, they can easily become the betrayer. Because if you internalize that I can't trust anybody in this world, then what does it matter if you're trust trustworthy? What does it matter if you tell the truth or if you lie? Because you don't... at, at the core, trust other people because you've been burned. And like I said, when you're burned as a kid, you grow up maladaptive. I believe that most people who develop uh, addictions like I did, pornography addiction at 12, alcoholism at 14, I believe that it's just a matter of we did not have um, any outlet for our trauma. We couldn't even, for the most part, voice our trauma. And that's why we discover these different things um, that that make us feel better, that numb us out, that calm the storm in our mind, because that storm is basically betrayal trauma. Mm. Mm. Wow! Wow, Joshua, you uh, just you just let us know pretty much, you know, what betrayal trauma is. Mm-hmm. You know, um, give us some insight, like on what what inspired you to really get into this um it's been a weird transition i uh i finally in 2014 faced the fact that i had some real addictions and you know faced it by my wife and my 
kids and my parents basically dragging me to rehab for alcoholism, um, mm-hmm. kicking and screaming the whole way, saying I didn't have a problem when mm-hmm. I had a pretty big problem. It was at that rehab that uh, I discovered about halfway through the time I was there um, by working with a specialist that I also had uh, pornography issues. I'd never heard of pornography addiction back in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I sat with this specialist and we started working and I had always known something happened to me when I was a kid, Mm -hmm. Uh, excuse me, at the hands of a babysitter, Mm -hmm. doing just a little bit of work we were able to uncover that there was quite a bit of sexual and uh, emotional slash mental abuse. Mm -hmm. And that really left an impression on me because what happened was I was essentially betrayed by this woman who was supposed to take care of me, who I counted on to take care of me, but you know, she violated me. She Mm -hmm. scared the heck out of me. She, you know, treated me horrible and she treated the other children around me horrible. And Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that. So there's the trauma from that. There's also trauma from the fact that I could never tell my parents because I was Mm -hmm. scared to death and and Mm -hmm. that they just allowed me to keep going there and they couldn't figure out what was happening. Mm -hmm. And while that's Mm -hmm. no fault of their own, it still nonetheless was was, uh, betrayal trauma. That's the first time that I heard it. Now, interestingly enough, I wrote my first book about pornography addiction that came out in January 2018. Mm. I thought that I would get a lot of addicts writing to me looking for help. That's not what happened. What I got was a lot of wives and girlfriends writing to me. What can I do? I can't believe he did this to me. And this was the first time I ever started having a lot, aside from my wife, the first time I started having a lot of conversations with the partners of pornography addicts and hearing just how broken they were. And I also started to speak to uh, women whose husbands had actually physically cheated on them. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, in a podcast that was hosted by a licensed uh, marriage and family technician or uh, therapist, excuse me, Uh, He and I were talking about this, and after it went off the air, we kept talking for another hour, and we decided to write a book, um, This, which was my second book, for the partners, the female partners specifically, of male porn addicts who just discover it. Because unlike food, unlike heroin, unlike gambling, pornography is one of those addictions that the partner suffers a lot too, because they wonder was I not enough? You know, why do they need somebody else? What, you know, is drawing them to this? And all these other questions that make a lot of sense. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the the reality is the partner never has anything to do with it. Uh, Mm -hmm. But that's hard to, that's hard to accept when you're the partner. So Mm -hmm. after I wrote this book, um, I started having a lot of people come to me and specifically ask, can you coach me on this? Can you help me through this? Can you speak to my husband, maybe? Can you speak to my boyfriend or in, in some cases, wife or girlfriend, depending on who has the problem. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I started doing that and I've really ramped it up over the last six, seven months. And I have pretty much an equal amount of clients right now who are dealing with pornography addiction recovery and who are mm-hmm. dealing with betrayal trauma recovery. Mm. Mm. Oh, I have a question with, with pornography addiction. Who yeah. is... And with your observation research, who is addicted more to porn? Is it men or women, or is it equal? Uh, statistically, over the long haul, it's been men. And mm-hmm. that's because pornography, for the most part, until the internet came out, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of pornography was geared towards straight white males. And once the internet came, it became so much cheaper to make pornography and so much cheaper to distribute it. So a lot of the movie companies, internet companies, they now make you know pornography for specific groups. Mm-hmm. So while we have figures on men lasting much longer, uh, the statistics for women reporting pornography addiction are actually faster growing than men right now. Mm-hmm. And my, my okay. guess is that it will catch up and it will eventually be even because men or women, we are both, you know, sexual creatures. Um, and, you know, we do have uh, curiosity out there. And now the fact that, you know, we give every 
10 year old kid, the greatest porn computer that's ever been created with the, with the smartphone, you know, it's, it's, it's really hitting the young people in our generation. Those who don't remember a world before the internet, they are the ones who are suffering the most. Doesn't matter whether they're, you know, white or black, gay or straight, male or female, you know, Christian, Jewish, atheist, it doesn't matter what they are. It matters that they are under about 30, 32 years old uh, mm. because they've grown up on internet pornography. Those are the ones that are just exploding with numbers. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I think about yeah. just like in the past couple of years, how OnlyFans, the website oh, OnlyFans, yeah. came out and originally I know that OnlyFans said that you know what's going on with it now was not the original intent of it but of course everybody else is, is using it's it using, too yeah you see um, women using it a lot yeah or to send well, um you know it, per, per personal like you know videos and pictures to other the users you in the sub a subscription that you need to have well, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you about, I wrote extensively about uh, OnlyFans in my most recent book, came out about a year ago. Um, mm. And what I did was I looked at the first few months of the pandemic because mm. the online pornography world in what would usually take them probably five years to grow, they grew that much in three months because mm. everybody was stuck at home in lockdown. And at the beginning of 2020, January 1st, 2020, OnlyFans had about 300,000 content makers, of mm -hmm. which 98% were pornography. Um, by the end of 2020, January 1st, 2021, there was between 1.3 and 1.5 million people making oh. pornography on OnlyFans. So that means that online pornography stars grew by one to 1.2 million just on that one site alone in 2020 mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. And yeah. It, it kind of mm -hmm. makes sense um, because I know a lot of people were saying that they lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were saying that they had full-time jobs and then they got part-time jobs. A lot of people saying they can't pay their bills and everything. And I know I heard a lot of ladies saying that, you know, it's their body, which it is, it's, it's their body. But I heard a lot of people saying that, it, you know, it's their body and everything and that, you know, that's how they're choosing to um, pay their bills because it's, it's easy. Well, like, all you have to if, do, you know. If you think about it, it's mostly men and women under 25 who are, uh, posting to only fans. Now, mm -hmm. these were the people who, for the most part, were the waitresses, the bartenders, the waiters, the hostesses, these, you know, good looking, you know, younger 20s, outgoing type people who, because of the pandemic, all of all of the service mm -hmm. industry shut down. So mm -hmm. let's say that you're a 22 year old, you know, mother of one, how do you pay your rent? Mm. Well, if you can't go get a job at a restaurant and nobody and most other places are doing reduced hours or nothing, you know, you're put in a really tough corner there. And that's mm -hmm. that's the thing that's tough for me, because I obviously am not pro pornography, um, but I can also understand, you know, you've got to feed your kid. You've got to keep a roof over your head. Um, I'm just hoping that as the uh, pandemic winds down here, mm -hmm. that more of these people will go back to traditional jobs, but you drive by restaurants and stuff and you see all the help wanted signs because, you know, and I, I interviewed probably about 20 uh, OnlyFans uh, content creators for my book. And mm -hmm. there was one who I talked to who said, you know, she made $14 an hour at the Gap. Mm -hmm. She was making $100 an hour on OnlyFans, just using it three hours a day. So why would she go and work eight hours a day at the Gap to make less than a third of the money she can make working in three hours? And she wasn't doing super triple X rated stuff. It was more artistic. It was more, you know, I don't want to say classy because I don't think any of it's classy, but it was, it was not as raunchy or dirty as some of the stuff could be. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, 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 it's one of these things where it's like this just, it's hard to tell her she's, she's right or wrong, but mm -hmm. it just shows you where we are as a society 
that this is a viable uh, income stream and this is a viable uh, occupational choice for mm -hmm. people. Yeah, well, so the, um, getting back to the betrayal trauma, what are, what are some symptoms that someone shows who experienced betrayal trauma? Uh, there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of uh, uh, disassociating. That's essentially when uh, something is so traumatic that you almost go into shock. You've seen people who, you know, are in a massive accident and they're just sitting behind the wheel like this, yeah. or you know, they're pulled mm -hmm. out of a fire. They are in shock. It's their mm -hmm. body is reacting mm -hmm. to shock. This is a different type of shock. It's not as massive as that physical kind of shock, but this. This hits you on a lower level and you do disassociate. Your, your brain is an amazing thing that basically says, I need to go into survival mode so we are not going to process what's happening in our outside world right now. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot, of the, a lot of the time. You see after, you know, uh, after a little while, um, you start to see people either begin to get a little bit better or descend even worse, that they start to you know, see the world as, as a place that was not what they thought it was. They start to question their own motivations. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that somebody else was the one that betrayed them, they start to turn it in on themselves and wonder you know, how much they've betrayed others. They wonder you know, who else has betrayed them because mm -hmm. what often happens whenever we have any traumatic episode, what it does, it brings up our trauma from the past as well. So if you have a relatively trauma-free life up to the point that you first have betrayal trauma, let's say you're 30 years old, mm -hmm. uh, you find out your husband's cheating on you or your wife's cheating on you, and it really, really affects you, of course, mm -hmm. but it doesn't bring you to your knees for usually. It doesn't completely wreck you because you didn't have that trauma as a kid. Um, you, didn't have, you don't have unresolved trauma as a kid. Um, that's what comes up when other mm -hmm. traumatic instances happen. When I sit with my clients for betrayal trauma, most of the time we're not talking about this most recent betrayal. We're going back and we're talking about stuff that happened when they were eight years old or 15 mm -hmm. years old or 20 years old. We have to get through that stuff before we can get to the final stuff. Mm -hmm. Because you know, in, in my case, I was addicted to two different things. My addiction wasn't the main problem. My addiction was a symptom of that trauma that I have. Mm. Trauma is usually the main problem when it comes to addiction. And instead mm. of letting my trauma bubble up when things got bad, I would just drink. I would just look at porn. And that mm. would make, you know, that would calm me. That would, that would de-stress me. And that's really when you get to talk to people with betrayal trauma, that's almost always their story um, is that they mm -hmm. have only found solace in alcoholism or drug abuse or food or gambling or sex or whatever their addiction may be. And it's only mm -hmm. until they go and find out how did I become this way that they're able to handle it. And I can tell you based on my addictions, when I finally went and did the hard work dealing with the trauma, which was what made me drink, which is what made me look at porn, when the trauma was gone, it was so much easier to drop those other addictions. It was so much mm -hmm. simpler because, you know, I had this giant wound that I kept putting a Band-Aid on called addiction. Well, when the wound actually heals, you don't need the Band-Aid anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I really push people who have addiction to, even if they haven't been betrayed very recently, to go back and look at betrayals uh, from before they started with their addiction, because odds are they turned to this stuff and they found that it relieved them of that pain. And that's why they stuck with it. It felt good at first and then it just takes over, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Well, it's, 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 I guess that's what makes it, um easy to fall into addictions and everything if it well, you know, feels good at first and then you don't realize you're an addict till it's too late till other people are uh -huh. pointing it out till mm -hmm. you know like i said I, I was pretty much dragged to rehab by my family and mm -hmm. it took me a week of being there 
before I finally accepted the fact that, gee, I really did have a massive drinking problem. Um, mm -hmm. I had a massive drinking problem for 24 years at that point when I went in back in 2014. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was one of these, I would have passed a lie detector test saying I didn't have a, a problem with it um, <laughs> because I didn't think I did. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't until I learned it. It wasn't until I sat there and dealt with it and then started to accept it and peel back the layers that I could recognize what was really happening. Mm. Well, mm. well, we, we're going to continue this on the next episode. Um, continue talking about this betrayal trauma because I believe that somebody out there needs to hear it. They yeah. need to know that other people have experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Joshua has experienced. I know myself. I've experienced things, and Christina has experienced things as well. Yeah. You know, you have to know that you're not alone out there. And yeah. hopefully, this, um, these, uh, this episode, the next episode, will bring you clarity and bring you peace. We encourage you to uh, get into a church. We encourage you to seek therapy. We encourage mm -hmm. you. Uh, to read some of the books uh, we will mention uh, on next uh, next episode at the end of the next episode yeah. we will mention those books and how you can follow with jo Joshua but for this episode this has been an ep another episode of CJ Honesty. Honesty peace and blessings CJ, CJ, CJ Honesty. Just being honest Nothing but the truth.